Right, so yesterday we learned that the budget deficit for August, folks, hold on to your hat. It's, well, $381 billion. That was the deficit. So the government took in $307 billion and spent $688 billion. My next guest says the Congressional Budget Office projects structurally high deficits forever unless, meaningful, unless it's meaningfully addressed. I want to bring in out Lynn Alden, Investment Strategy founder, Lynn Alden. Lynn, you, know, I, I, you wrote that the conservative baseline calls for over $20 trillion in net new public debt additions over the next 10 years. And, you know, I mean, it's so crazy because the numbers sound nuts, and, and yet there are folks out there that say, don't worry about this kind of stuff. Every time we sell treasuries, a buyer step up is not a problem. What are they missing? Uh, I think they're missing the fact that we don't have structurally falling interest rates anymore. And so, the, you know, to, to some of these critics' credit, there were people that called for called for debt problems 30 years ago, and they were early because we had this really long period of falling interest rates. So the falling interest rates offset the rising debt levels. The, I think the big challenge going forward is we, we don't have those falling interest rates anymore, even if we just chop around sideways from here on out. Uh, in kind of a narrow band, um, the interest expense keeps increasing from here. And I think it becomes a probably a, a bigger deal. I think people learned the long, wrong lesson from that past 30 years. So you've been writing about uh, fiscal dominance for a few years now, really, you know, a lot more intensely. And I'm fascinated by it. I'm also terrified, though, by the numbers and also terrified by the lack of public awareness. Just, you know, talk to us a little bit because you outline six items on why deficits are so sticky and how we've gotten to this problem. Share it with the audience. Right. So a lot of it is built in over decades. Um, so Social Security, the way it was designed uh, many decades ago, did not really account for slowing population growth. Uh, and so when, when they project out what that's going to look like, there's fewer people paying in for every retiree. And so that's expected to run dry by uh, 2035. Uh, we have the highest per capita health care costs in the world. A lot of that's on the, on the government ledger. And uh, we don't really have higher average care quality to show for it. Um, so we have, we have kind of inefficient administration overhead uh, in our health care system. Uh, you know, very large military expense, a number of different factors. And now interest expense is actually becoming a pretty meaningful right. item. Right. And so as, as this kind of goes on, it becomes a pretty structural issue. So, I, and then, you know, listen, to your point, Granny didn't, you know, wasn't thrown off the cliff two decades ago, right? And everyone's kind of said, okay, it's not a big deal. If it's never addressed, let's just say we keep going the way we're going because we don't have the political will or we just don't wake up. What's the worst possible outcome? So the worst outcome is that basically the central bank kind of loses control of its ability to do monetary policy because if you have an illiquid or otherwise unfunctioning treasury market, the, the Federal Reserve has to come in and essentially backstop it, and then you risk inflation. Uh, you risk kind of structurally large fiscal debts, uh, deficits of which some of it is monetized. Um, and you can go into a pretty significant period of currency debasement. And there's other there's other investors that are kind of looking out. For example, Ray Dalio is concerned uh, four or five years down the line uh, for that becoming a problem. The exact time frame is hard to, to measure exactly, but I think we're already seeing around the margins a number of consequences from these very large, big deficits, the inflationary backdrop that they add, uh, and some of the pressures they put on on different parts of the economy. So so with that with – that could that be the, the thing that trips us up, that takes us from our sort of uh, preeminence, you know, the world's reserve currency, those sort of things that we enjoy right now and perhaps take for granted? Uh, in the long term, yes. I think in, in the intermediate term, nothing really stops this train. I think this is kind of locked in uh, for, for quite a while. Um, and it's not like calling for something major by next year or the year after. Um, but I do think that we are now more structurally in this period where we can't necessarily assume that the forward sector is going to be uh, buying a lot of our treasuries. We can't assume that the private sector is always ready to gonna step in with reasonable yields. Um, and even to the extent that they do, um, basically, anyone holding those is likely to get, you know, gradually devalued in terms of their purchasing power over the next five, ten, fifteen years. Um, so I, I do think it is a longer-term issue that has consequences now. Um, and it's, you know, a decade ago, this was a meaningful political uh, item that would come up. They right. would debate how, what are we going to do about the deficits. And now, one of the one of the things that both parties kind of agree on is not really to cut any of the major spending areas. They've got a, plenty of other differences, but. Uh, the major areas of spending and the size are, are not really be, like meaningful topics uh, in the current political climate. 